Hello, everyone. This is Elizabeth Reagan of the Society of Plastics Engineers, and I'd like to welcome you to today's ELI presentation, Plastics Material Selection. Our program today will be about one hour in length, including a question and answer session following the presentation. I will instruct you at that time on how to address your questions to the speaker. If you have any technical difficulties during the program, please press star zero on your telephone to contact customer care. They will be happy to assist you. Today's presenter is Melissa Kurtz. Melissa is a senior materials scientist at Stork Tech Met Inc., where she specializes in the deformulation, failure analysis, and material selection of polymers. She has over eight years of experience specifically in the areas of product development and processing. Four years were spent as a materials engineer at Vistia Corporation, a Tier 1 automotive supplier. During that time, she simultaneously received her master's degree in materials science and engineering at Wayne State University. Her bachelor's degree in materials science and engineering was obtained while attending the University of Minnesota. Melissa, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have to apologize. I have a bit of a cold, so I might sound kind of stuffy, and I might need to take a break to cough and blow my nose every once in a while. Um, the introduction to today's presentation is basically the fact that several um, considerations need to be um, undertaken when selecting a polymer material for a product. Um, the, the difficulty comes in knowing the full product requirements um, in a wide range of environments as well as uh, thoroughly understanding how that polymer is going to behave in that environment. Um, today, we're going to basically talk about some polymer basics. I'm just going to introduce you to some, um, some polymer basic concepts that I want to make sure everybody has before we go forward. Then we're going to talk about some selection considerations, and then we're going to go through some case studies, which are going to focus specifically on material selection uh, and or material replacement. So just as a quick intro, um, a polymer is uh, basically um, small um, units, chemical units, bonded, and make up long, long organic molecules. An example of those um, most popular examples today include polypropylene, which is just a repeating structure of, of that, what you see on the screen, as well as uh, uh, nylon-6, which is just a repeat of that smaller molecule um, seen there. Um, polymers can be characterized into two general groups. Um, thermoplastics, which soften when they're heated, they harden upon cooling, and can be resoftened. Um, these, these materials have a limited upper surface temperature. Um, however, they can be rarely recycled. Um, thermosets, uh, another classification, um, they harden when they're heated. They have chemical crosslinks, which uh, do not allow the material to resoften. Um, the benefit to this uh, thermoset material um, is it has a higher surface temperature than thermoplastics. Um, however, it is very difficult to recycle. Our focus today will be on thermoplastic materials, um, which can be further um, broken down into amorphous materials uh, and semi-crystalline materials. Amorphous materials are characterized by a random entanglement of chains. They also usually contain bulky side groups, which don't allow uh, for a snug packing of chains. Um, these, these characteristics basically allow uh, light to pass, which makes the materials um, optically transparent. Um, they also allow for chemicals to penetrate, which gives the material um, poor relative chemical resistance. Semicrystalline materials are characterized by an ordered arrangement of chains um, and the absence of bulky side groups, which allows for close packing of the chains. Um, because of this, um, light is not allowed to pass through material, and chemicals are prevented from penetrating. <clears throat> this gives a semi-crystalline material um, its optical or its opaque properties, and it also gives it its improved chemical resistance over amorphous materials. And one thing to note here is that um, the semi-crystalline, the, the general properties of semi-crystal material, are regulated um, by crystalline content as a semi-crystalline um, infers that it's made up of both crystalline regions as well as some amorphous content. In this next slide, we'll basically summarize um, the effect of the degree of crystallinity in a semi-crystalline polymer. So as, uh, as crystalline increases, in general, um, chemical resistance will increase, um, tensile strength will increase, melting point will increase, and 
oppositely is, is amorphous content increases, um, impact strength will increase, um, elongation will increase, along with uh, dimensional stability. Now these are just generalizations, of course, and are dependent on the material that you're looking at. But one important thing to note is that crystallinity can also be um, further controlled to some extent um, during the molding process. Um, this means that when you, when you dial in a molding process for a part in a material, um, once that, that's been optimally defined, um, it needs to be tightly controlled as well uh, to ensure that the same crystallinity is um, maintained from, from lots of parts to, to, to parts. Other things that can be used to modify the polymer properties, um, just besides its general um, traits, whether it's amorphous or semi-crystalline, um, is, is the addition of additives. Um, additives would include plasticizers, which will make the material more flexible, flame retardants, which will obviously uh, in improve the flammability of the material. Um, flame retardants, uh, the majority of them today are, are made from uh, aluminum trihydrate, phosphorus base, halogenated, or uh, antimonium oxide um, type materials. Um, it's important to note that additives may have a secondary effect on the behavior of the polymer. Um, for example, in the case of the flame retardant, as you can see in this table, um, the flame retardant packages uh, basically result in an uninspected, un unexpected property change. You can see as the um, flame retardant um, material increases from a, from unfilled to a B2, which is a, a very high rated uh, material, in a, in a V0 as well, um, you can see how the tensile strength um, is affected as well as the modulus and the, and the impact strength. So it's important to note that when selecting a material that you um, try out and understand the properties of the material that you're using, not that you choose a, for example, like a polycarbonate material and you go back and you want to get it flame retardant, you've got to understand that the, the properties could change as well and those need to be considered. Um, some additional additives are stabilizers, anti-static agents, blowing agents. Um, blowing agents basically are used to decrease part weight and, and also uh, the, part, the cost of the part. Um, but these can also create defects within the part that can compromise the strength and the t integrity. Because basically, when you use a blowing agent, you're basically creating kind of controlled defects. Um, sometimes if they're not as controlled, they can result in a, in a defect that would result in failure of the part. Additionally, colorants can be added, uh, fillers, both uh, reinforcing and non-reinforcing. And we're going to take a closer look at how, uh, how fillers will affect the properties of the material as well. Um, reinforcing fillers um, basically improve the mechanical performance of the material. They, they act to transfer stress, um, basically, to the reinforcement. They dilute the stress, and then they transfer back to the polymer matrix. These types of fillers include um, fibers and other high aspect ratio minerals. Um, the, key, the key thing to remember for, for reinforcing fillers is that um, the aspect ratio is important, that it's a high aspect ratio, as well as coupling. <coughs> um, coupling is very important because it, it basically determines how much stress can be transferred from the reinforcement, or to, to and from the reinforcement. Um, the coupling agent on, on the fibers or filler will basically ensure an excellent bond between them and optimize the, the, the stress transfer. Um, it's important to note here that, that glass fiber um, containing resins that do not use a coupling agent um, would not be considered reinforced resins. They would be considered filled resins. And the performance will, will vary as well. And I'll show that example of that in the, on the next slide. Um, just a quick um, definition of aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is defined by the length divided by the diameter. So a bead, for example, or a sphere would be would have an aspect ratio of one. In a short fiber to long fiber to nanofiber, it would increase in aspect ratio, and as that increases, it would result in a, in a higher increase in strength as well. So a bead or, or a sphere um, would not be considered a uh, reinforcement because its aspect ratio is is one. Uh, short fibers are very effective in reinforcing um, materials. Um, they're very popular right now. Um, the, the only drawbacks are that they accelerate the tool wear of the of the mold, and they also increase uh, the potential for part warpage and anisotropy, which is basically um, orientation effects of the, of the filler within the material and how the properties will vary as well. 
and I'll take a look at, at, at those effects in a later slide as well. Uh, long fibers are often used in very large parts to increase part strength. However, um, the fiber length retention of these fibers is very uh, critical, um, and therefore if you have a small part or if you have a part that has lots of right angles or a part that has lots of thin walls, then you have this uh, potential to basically uh, decrease the fiber length as it goes through the, through the, through the part during processing. And um, the more you basically decrease your fiber length um, during molding, the less effective uh, that, that fiber is going to be in your part. Um, long fibers also have potential for part warpage and isotropy as well. Um, and costs are a factor because um, you cannot utilize regrind within the same part because as you, as you regrind the part, you basically keep um, destroying the fiber length. Nanofibers are, are a really great way to increase the strength of the part, and they don't come with the drawbacks of part warpage and isotropy, but they do have a relatively high material cost right now, so they're not used in um, a significant amount of, of, of parts to date. But as they increase in their commercial availability, the price will be expected to go down as well. Here's a, here's a quick example of how uh, the reinforcement will affect the properties of the material. Um, also looking at aspect ratio and, and, the, and the importance of coupling here. You can see that um, if you look at a glass bead fill, which has aspect ratio of, of 1, and compare that to a glass fiber reinforced, you can see how how much of an increase you'll get in strength, um, and you'll get a, also an increase in modulus as well. Elongation goes down a little bit, but overall you're getting your increase in strength that you need. In long glass fiber, which is the higher aspect ratio um, filler, that reinforcement that will also uh, show even a, a better increase in strength compared to the short glass fiber reinforced material. And you can see the effect of coupling if you look at the glass fiber filled resin versus the glass fiber reinforced, um, basically you see a significant increase in strength um, and elongation, which basically indicates that you're getting increased ductility with, with adding that coupling agent as well. Some non-reinforcing fillers um, would include uh, low aspect ratio minerals and particles. These are, these are often considered extenders because they basically displace the, cro the cost of the resin um, for something that's, that's not as expensive. Um, but they can, they can definitely have a, a effect on material properties. And it's important to note also that um, mineral, mineral filler is a general term, and there can be some small performance differences that are observed between uh, talc filler versus calcium carbonate, et cetera, which are, which are all considered mineral fillers. Um, I often, you know, my customers tell me that they have a mineral filled part. I often ask them to have their supplier spell out exactly what it's filled with. That way we know what we're using. If we need to ever change um, resins for some reason, we're sure to get the same thing and have the same properties. Um, typically, one thing to note, too, is that polymers that contain these non-reinforcing fillers or extenders also have a lower toughness um, compared to their, their unfilled um, selves. Um, basically because the extenders tend to act as defects by interrupting the polymer matrix. And this next slide basically shows you some of the small um, differences you'll see in properties um, when you compare different types of mineral fillers. So you can see here, for example, that when you have the calcium carbonate filled, you're seeing um, a much, a much less strength and much less modulus compared to the talc and mica filled. Uh, materials. So if you're if you're using something that's talcum mica filled and, you, and some, somehow you switch to a calcium carbonate, you would expect to see a decrease in performance of your part, um, and vice versa as well. If you're using calcium carbonate and you're having failure and you want to go to something that's going to give you just a little bit more strength and, and stiffness, going to a talc filled or mica filled material would be the way to go. And also, there's probably you know a small cost difference between those three types of mineral fillers as well. 